Welcome to Computer Networks. This is lecture four. Let's start with some announcements. As all of you already know, including the website that I talked about earlier, homework two is due this week. And we've also released homework three. Uh, hopefully some of you got a chance to look at it. If not, uh, it's worth uh, looking at it for the following reason. For homework two, you're building an HTTP client. And for homework three, you're building a web server, which is an HTTP server. So uh, if you look at homework three now, at least you know, if you read it, it'll give you a sense for what part of homework two you might be able to reuse for homework three. For example, parsing HTTP headers or writing HTTP headers. So you might be able to write homework two in, in a way that will allow you to easily reuse for homework three. So just uh, if you haven't done that yet, please at least read homework three. Uh, you don't have to you know, work on it uh, right now if you haven't finished homework two. Uh, but uh, I think that'll be very helpful if you do that. Okay, it'll, it'll help you determine, okay, I might have to reuse this for homework three, so I'm gonna code it in a particular way. So I'll uh, release homework four maybe today, tomorrow, something like that, so that you can uh, get a head start uh, if you want. Uh, today we're gonna talk about two topics. One is HTTP performance. Basically, we're going to wrap up our discussion of HTTP from last time. And we're going to talk about uh, not domain name system. Just, this bugs me, so I'm going to just uh, fix it right here. Domain name system. As we recall from last time, HTTP is the protocol that is used by web clients and web server. And we talked about a scenario that is prevalent today, which is most web pages, they have 10, 20, 30, 40, maybe even 100 objects in a single page, right? If you look at your Facebook page, it has a bunch of text, and it has potentially you know, 30, 40, 50, maybe 100 you know, small images, right? The way standard HTTP protocol works in that particular scenario is you first send a request for the HTML page. You get the text page. And the browser will parse what's in the HTML. It realizes there are 100 different images. That's very common these days, right? And it will sequentially send a request for each image. Let's say we start with image number one. You send a request for image one, we get an image back. This is just like what you're doing in your homework, right? From command line, you specify a URL and you get an image back. Browser does the same thing. Once you receive image number one, you send a request for image number two, and three, and four, and five, all the way till 100, if that's the number of images that you have on the page. Fetching web content in this manner has one main problem, which is latency. Let's say it takes two seconds to get an image. Then if a page actually has 100 images, it's going to take 200 seconds. We clearly don't want to wait that long for a page to load. So we need a way to paralyze some of these requests so that we can load the page faster. So that's what we talked about towards the end of the uh, last lecture. So if you have a lot of small requests, clearly we need to paralyze the request because latency is going to dominate. right? How about if we have big requests? We probably need a different set of considerations, which we are going to um, also address in a few minutes. Let's think about small requests. For example, a lot of these small images. So latency is going to matter, because we're going to send a request for the image, and the image is going to come back. We're not necessarily interested in um, downloading a large image in this particular case, but we're going to take a hit proportional to the, or equal to the round trip time. Right? If the round trip time is five seconds, it's going to take five seconds. Two major causes, as we discussed last time. First is we just have to open the TCP connection to the server. That's probably going to take a couple, at least one round trip, because uh, the client has to say, OK, I want to connect to that server, and the server has to respond saying, OK, you're connected. You're, you're doing that, right, with server or socket programming. Once the connection is established, you send a request saying, I want image number one, 
and the aim is that to come back. So at least we're talking about at least two round trips. So how do we mitigate this? One idea is to use something called persistent connection. Rather than establish a new connection for each image request, reuse the connection. Just request the second and then third and then the fourth image on the same connection. That way, we don't have to pay for at least one round trip it takes to establish a new connection. Does that make sense? So you establish one connection, take a hit of one round trip, and then we just send requests for images using the same connection. For a browser to tell the server that it supports this feature, you just put this particular header called connection and say keep alive. We support that. So that's the first problem and how we might solve it. The problem being <coughs> you have to establish a connection, which is going to take one round trip for each file that you request. We solve that problem. Or we talked about how we might solve that problem. The second problem is the requests are serialized. Let's say we have 100 different images, and we send, OK, request image 1, request image 2, request image 3. So that's similar to what is called stop and wait protocol, which we will learn in great detail in the next few weeks when we start talking about transport. There are two solutions to this. One is called pipeline requests. Some of you have probably encountered this phrase called pipelining when you studied uh, probably architecture or computer organization or something like that. What does pipelining mean? Or what's the, can you describe the technique? Okay, yeah, that's a that's a reasonable description. So the idea, so how would you transfer that in HTTP? Somebody else. So some someone suggested that pipelining is a method in which you send um, you don't wait until the first request is completed, right? So how do you how do we translate that to HTTP? Can it be multiple connections? Um, so pipeline, you don't necessarily need multiple. So that's the second technique. So you're a little bit ahead of me, but. Uh, Somebody else, how might you use pipelining in HTTP? You could send the requests for everything you want over the connection, and then the server just piles them all through to you without waiting for the next, for you to request the next image, because it knows what the next image you want is, so it just sticks that in, and it sticks in the next one, and so on, without waiting for specific requests for each one. Yeah, seems like that's a very reasonable way to pipeline requests. So the suggestion was, Rather than send a request for image one, receive it. Send a request for image two, receive it. Rather than doing that, you just say request image one, request image two, request image three. You're not even waiting for the first response to be completed. And once you've sent all the requests, you're going to receive responses in sequence. What is required for that particular protocol to work is a clear way to identify which response corresponds to each request. Does that make sense? Or you have to assume it's going to be in the same sequence. But if you want to be really sure, uh, it's uh, important to be able to identify which response corresponds to which request. Otherwise, the client will be very confused. Any, any question about pipelining? Do most of the browsers support pipelining? They don't. There was another suggestion. Open multiple connections, parallel connections. So this is you know, easier to understand and describe. So rather than open one connection between the browser and the server, and request all of your images on that one connection, you just open multiple, let's say 10. Yeah, we're going to do something <laughs> along this line, something of this flavor for the next homework, which is uh, for homework three, you built the basic web server. And in homework three, we started, we started worrying about you know, how to uh, make it a higher performance. Not necessarily a high performance, but at least higher performance. So you basically have the browser open multiple connections to the server and send requests in parallel. Hopefully, you'll receive responses in parallel. 
you said that most browsers don't support pipelining. Yeah, pipelining they don't, but uh, uh, why not? I think it's a little bit complex. And if you can just do parallel connection, why not? You but could. it's not easy to do both. But I mean, the people who work at Google are not stupid. I doubt that. Yeah. I doubt that they cannot implement pipeline. So, I don't know all the reasons, but I can guess why it's not so prevalent is, first of all, it's a little bit complex and simple, you know, just send a request and receive a response. We, we, we're on the same page, at least on that, right? You agree. That's a little bit more okay, complex, no, right? It's more complex. Right. So, the second reason is, we need the servers as well as the browsers to support it in precisely the same way. And every time you try to get completely different parties to agree on something a little bit more complex like pipelining, it's just going to take a lot of effort, and they probably tried. The standard does exist, by the way, uh, but uh, it's, it's not widely used for that reason. Because you need to get the server folks, you know, Microsoft and uh, Mozilla, and many other server guys to work with the browser guys. And finally, you know, another guess is <coughs> you can probably get the same performance improvement using parallel connection. I will actually post a reading for you guys uh, about uh, parallel connections when I post the homework. Uh, people thought this idea of parallel connection is going to just um, Kill all the servers in the internet. Can you can you guess why people were worried about that? People thought it was a bad idea for browsers to use multiple connections, parallel connections. Which connection was in the thread? Sure. And why is that bad? And, uh, because back in the day, CPU <coughs> computers were not so oriented towards multiplicity. Sure. It's so basically it's going to consume a lot of resources at the server, right? If, if each browser starts establishing you know, eight connections or ten connections. Now suddenly the server is having to do you know, ten times more work. So people were really worried about the servers. Will they be able to keep up with this? And I'll I'll put a link to that article. It's kind of interesting to. More servers don't open each thread to a connection somehow. Try it again. Uh, there is a new server that came out mm -hmm. and Jinx. It doesn't mm -hmm. open the new thread per connection. Yeah, so you could you could do right. You could do asynchronous. You could do event driven, uh, event driven style programming as well. There's a whole science behind uh, making web servers work faster, better with fewer resources, um, etc. Um, but uh, I'll post some links about that. But uh, it's definitely worth reading the parallel connections because you're going to do uh, something with that flavor for the homework anyway. All right, any questions about how people thought about they might reduce the latency for page loads when we have complex pages? And when you say complex pages, we're talking about a page that has hundreds of objects or tens of objects at least. Let's think about larger objects. How might we solve this problem for larger objects? So. The problem is no longer RTT for its request. We're just trying to download a large file. That's what we're trying to do. How might we solve that problem? So one solution that partially addresses this problem is something called proxy. Let's imagine a scenario when we have multiple clients within an organization that are trying to download the same file, and it's a huge file. In that case, it makes sense to cache that content internally so that we don't have to use the link between let's say, our organization and the internet, which might be a low bandwidth link. That's the idea behind proxy caches. But for this to work, something has to be true about the content the clients are trying to access. And what is that? Although it just doesn't work. Something has to, some condition has to be true about what the clients are trying to access. They have to all be trying to access the same thing. Yeah. They all have to be trying to access the same thing. Otherwise, we can't cache, right? What are those, can you give me some scenarios when that might be true? 
that clients are trying to access the same thing. Because if that's a rare thing, then casting is probably not going to help much. Uh-huh. Yeah, but uh, video is a little bit uh, more difficult than the straightforward caching because if it is streaming, you're not really storing a lot, and you might have different bit rates. Those are different files, right? Um, it's uh, easier to focus on downloads of static files in this case. <coughs> any any examples? Yeah. Uh, logos for pages, they, they change uh, very rarely. And casting works even if the content is small, right? It's not just large. It's especially good if the content is large. But even if the content is small, if you don't have to go all the way to the internet, uh, it will, first of all, make your access faster. And second, you are freeing up the, your outbound link for something maybe more important. Any questions about HTTP proxies? I'll mention one other thing. We would desire the services to be transparent. And that's a phrase that you might hear time and again when people are talking about network services. What that means is the clients should not even know if you're using their cash or not. It's completely transparent to them. Because if the clients need to reconfigure, then they might not be willing to do that. It might be error prone. So you'll hear that phrase a lot. Something is transparent, something is not transparent. In this particular case, the definition of transparent would be the clients don't even know if they're using proxy or not. When when you install a new operating system, sometimes uh, when you start the browser for the first time, have you uh, noticed that uh, the browsers might sometimes ask you to specify if you're using a proxy server or not? Uh, have you noticed that? I think uh, it's less common now. It used to be more common maybe a few until a few years ago. But you can do that even now. You can go to the Connections tab and specify the address of the proxy server, right? You can you know, go you know, look at your browser, go to the settings tab or something like that. And what happens is once you specify the address of the proxy server, everything else is completely transparent. You just go to you know, www.google.com. You don't need to say, I'm going to go to this proxy server, et cetera, et cetera. You just say www.google.com, and uh, there is no difference. Either you go to the proxy server or not. The client doesn't even need to worry about it. Now let's go through this uh, simple exercise because uh, simple exercise of thinking about what the protocol might look like between the client, which can be a web browser or it, it could be a STB client, right? And the proxy server and a web server. Let's think about what the protocol might look like. Any suggestion? Now just to recap. The goal of the proxy server is to cache the content so that uh, next time when somebody else asks for the same content, you don't have to go all the way to the web server. By the way, another benefit of proxy server is uh, you not only reduce the load on the network, but also on the server. Right? Have you guys heard of the word uh, slash dotting? <laughs> Slashdot is a pretty old site. If someone gets posted, if something gets posted on a very popular site, what's going to happen? Everybody goes to it. Yeah. And then what's, what's going to happen to the server? It yeah, it's probably going to melt, right? If you have these caches around the world, or at least in your network, you could cache that content and then not go all the way to the server. All right. So let's think about this uh, protocol, and I'll tell you what the exact protocol looks like uh, as well. So let's, let's think about, so what does the client need to be able to tell the proxy server? <coughs> let's design this protocol. Send an HTTP request to the Yeah, <coughs> the client needs to say, I'm interested in accessing 
www.google.com or uh.edu or something like that. How, how about the proxy to the server? Um, when you use by transfer protocol. What transfer protocol? Um, by transfer protocol. Uh, yeah. I, I would say it's much closer to your homework too. Isn't it? There's a specific name for that message. Get, right? You could, you could just do get. Right? That's what the proxy is telling the server. And what comes back from server to proxy? The OK message. Right? That's the content. Does that make sense? <coughs> and how does the proxy reply to the client? So what does the proxy do? So you receive, a, receive some file from the server. You potentially store it in your hard disk. And then you reply to the client, right? So the message that the proxy sends to the server, it's a get message. Is that right? Because that's what the server knows how to speak, HTTP protocol. This is, and how about the message <coughs> coming from the server to the proxy? So it's a good response. OK, right? How about the message here between client and proxy? What does the client know how to do? Client is a regular web browser, by the way. What's the message going out from a client, from a web client or HTTP client? It's a get message, right? And what is this client designed to handle as far as incoming messages go? What does the web browser receive? Or an HTTP client, what does it receive? HTTP response is an OK message. Does that make sense? So this probably looks very similar, if not identical, to the get message. And that one, too. And the responses, they look very similar, if not identical, to the HTTP response that we've, we've been talking about and working on for homework, too. Is the proxy going to cache everything from every single response that comes from all the clients attached to it? That's a good question. And the answer is, it depends on what you want to do. <laughs> yeah. So some proxies have some policy. I mean, they're going to only cast in a certain type of content. And sometimes it's important because, let's think about dynamic web pages. It's not a good use of storage to store the content of dynamic web page because the content is supposed to change. Every time the client goes, the, goes through the page, it's supposed to change. For example, let's say, we're talking about a page that shows what the current time is and where the client is. It just doesn't make sense to cache that, right? Usually on the response coming back, there's a specific header in the HTTP response that says, is it a cacheable content or not? So you can use that hint to decide if you want to cache that or not. But it's entirely up to the proxy server. The proxy server can still choose to cache something. It's usually not a good idea to cache something that is tagged as non-cacheable, but it's up to the proxy server. It's a general purpose computer program, you know. You can just cache whatever you want. But typically you cache content that you expect to not expire. That's the phrase that they use. Because the response sometimes might also have a date that says, you know, it's going to expire on this date. But things like logos, they usually don't expire. So you can cast those. All right, this is uh, something for you to think about. As I said, there are some small tweaks to HTTP protocol when, there's a, when there is a proxy in between. And it's just interesting uh, to find out what they are. All right, before we go, get into domain name system, let's uh, take maybe a couple minutes break. OK? <coughs> <coughs> if you have any questions, if you want to discuss anything, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Because the person on the list of these does love to the same time. I don't know, I hope that every, every time I see somebody's going to do You guys have any feedback about the course? I'm happy to hear that too. They want to consider where to mic. Microphone. Oh, it's uh, because when you walk away from it, it's, it's kind of hard to hear. Uh, how about for now? I'll try to stay closer here. When, I, when I'm closer here, can you can you hear it? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, okay. You can okay. Tell when you're standing there, I see. Okay, I'll away. I'll try to learn the better way. And if I'm if I'm not able to learn, I'm happy to wear a microphone. Or you could constantly shout in the direction. Of the computer. <laughs> if you turn the computer, do you think it would help? So maybe maybe up yeah, here even right. So how about we'll evaluate this technique? <laughs> Still tilted this way. Though. <laughs> any, any other feedback? Is the programming too much, too little? <laughs> What's that? There, there will be some written assignments at some point. <laughs> you just want to do programming? Yeah. But what will happen is some of the future assignments um, they will involve uh, not just C. You might have to do a little bit of shell scripting and all, basically tying together different programs and stuff like that. So you might uh, I might not be able to solve that problem, which is you know, some new platform, new language kind of thing. But uh, but if the load is becoming overwhelming. I would definitely like to hear that so that I can, uh, you know, recalibrate. Maybe, you know, you can, uh, because, you know, over time I realize I can just, in this assignment, it take more time to develop something for which things already exist. Like, mm -hmm. for example, HTTP request, I made the structure that everything is parsed into a structure. Colors are separate, uh, it's an array of strings, and mm -hmm. to, to parse and tokenize everything, I understand that was the principle yeah, yeah, yeah. of the homework was was parsing things. But yeah, yeah. for example, even the next homework we have also to parse something. Yeah. Maybe we could use uh, pre-existing yeah. libraries to parse as well. Yeah. So implementing we'll that thing will take longer than that. <laughs> right, right, right. So we will say um, if everyone parsed everything correctly and if we feel everyone is a very good parser, then for for the future assignments. I'll, I'll say you can use any parser. No, but I mean, yeah. I, but, I but I think it's worth doing a little bit of parsing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah, didn't yeah, want to. It was useful yeah. for Windows. So. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I think so what library do you use? I use everything. No, I'm talking about Windows. I was in the next year. I was in the next I was in the next year. I was in the next year. Linux is a lot better. You're, you're about to say something. I was going to say, if you could just post, like, you know, like a one sentence description of what, like, the next thing you buy from work, then that lets us look and say, well, okay, I'm going to be doing more stuff with this stuff, so I should take the extra time to turn it into, like, a, a more reusable library function rather than just, you know, plopping it in my main right here and leaving it be. So, what's going to happen? Uh, at least one or two projects will be multi week projects. And in that case, it will be obvious, but uh, it's only the beginning of the class where you know, one assignment might be longer than another and another. Uh, we're going to explore, you know, I think, uh, pretty discrete topics in the future. Okay, so later on they won't be building on each other. No, no, no. I mean, they'll be building on, but it'll be, I'll give, give that to you in one shot. Yeah. Say that again? Uh -huh. So what the, what does unit testing mean? I mean I don't know what unit testing is. <laughs> 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 doesn't even have classes. Oh, I see. What what test cases should you perform? Yeah, you won't have you won't have it. No, I just was because I was writing it. So the pass from the buffer, you just make a class from the buffer that allocates memory constructs, allocates 
reason to disrupt this. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Forget yeah. about it. Manually, you know, yeah. 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 watch yeah. every bike, make sure you So, I think a lot of the unit testing and uh, many of these concepts are new, newer, than the, newer than the C programming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, All right, maybe we should start. All right, so we're going to learn about domain name system in the next <laughs> half an hour or so. <coughs> Whenever we access a website, we don't use IP addresses. We use some names. We call them host names because these are easier to remember, easier to share. Names such as www.facebook.com, it's a lot easier to remember than what the IP address might be. IP addresses, on the other hand, they have some benefit. For example, an IP address pretty much tells you how to send your packet to that particular host. Just, I'm simplifying that a little bit, but if someone were to give you an IP address, you immediately know which link you are supposed to use to send a packet to that particular internet host. But just with domain name, you can't do that because domain name is designed in a completely different way. Right? They're designed to be descriptive of what the content on that particular computer might be so that they're easier to remember and so forth. So there are some advantages to IP addresses. For example, routing. Routing just means uh, you're forwarding packet from one node to another, to another, to the destination. So it seems like we need both. And domain name uh, systems allow us to use host names and associate them to IP addresses, because we can't get rid of IP addresses for internet routing. For example, if you tell a router I want to send this packet to you know, www.facebook.com, the router would not know. So we need both, okay? But we want them to be separate. Right? We said you know, we want them both, and we, we can't really mix them, particularly because sometimes we might, this probably has happened to some of you who have done maybe web hosting and uh, written various applications. Sometimes you might want to continue using the same name, but use a different machine, because maybe the older machine got smaller or can't handle all the requests anymore, or you've de decided to physically move the machine to a different place. So your address might change, but you want to continue using the same name. And this is the reason you want to keep them separate. If they were some t somehow kept the same, if you move a machine to a different organization, then you'd, you'd have to come up with a, you have to remember something completely different. Because we don't want to do that, right? Uh, we hear, you know, Facebook is opening a data center in this country, this location. We don't want to remember that. We just want to remember as www.facebook.com. So that's the reason we want to keep them separate, because we use them for different purposes, and there is no sense in uh, uh, combining them. There are other advantages to keeping them separate. It turns out we can use names to do load balancing. We're going to talk about that in the next lecture, actually. And there are some other benefits that you can study on your own. So we would like to use both, because we need, need them both. But we also want to keep them separate in some ways. So. When we started building the internet, there weren't a lot of hosts in the internet. So it is possible to list all the names and the corresponding address on a single file. It is possible to do that. But is, is, is that possible today? It's not. How, how many hosts are there in the internet? I don't even know. Let's think about why that's impractical. First of all, there's a technical reason. File would be huge, several gigabytes probably. There's another technical problem, which is, <coughs> let's say you know we put a computer in the internet. Here's the host's file, and if everyone had to do a lookup, then 
this server would have to process a large number of resolution requests. Basically, every, everyone, someone wants to go to www.facebook.com, you have to send a request to the server saying, what is the IP address corresponding to this name? So can you imagine how many requests the server would have to process? A large number. So that's clearly not possible. Here's another technical reason, single point of failure. If the server crashes, what happens? So what, let's think about it. Let's say the server crashes. Is it true that the connection between, let's say, my laptop and Facebook server, that hasn't gone down? But what's the problem? Can't look up the IP address of Facebook. Yeah, can't look up the IP address of Facebook. Then it's almost the same as the whole internet going down. Even though that's not the case, technically all the... <coughs> Connections are still intact. If I knew the IP address of Facebook, I could still access Facebook, right? But I wouldn't have the way to conveniently go to my browser and say www.facebook.com because when I say that to my browser, my browser would have sent the address resolution request to the server that I just crashed. So it's almost the same as the whole internet going down, even though technically that's not true. How about the politics? So here's a very difficult question. What organization should be responsible for maintaining that database? Any ideas? Who should be responsible for maintaining this database? That says, you know, www.facebook.com is this particular server, or this particular IP address. I, I want to hear some ideas on uh, on who might be appropriate? United Nations. United Nations. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other ideas? Any, anyone thinks that's a bad idea? Can you probably yeah. just have a host many sites? So, um, it's not really practical. <laughs> not the U.S. government? Not the U.S. Yeah. government, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Isn't it the U.S. government that routes most of the. That's <laughs> not true anymore, but that, that was totally true 20, 30 years ago. But should the U.S. government be the right entity to run this? That's the question to ask, regardless of who runs it. Who can you trust to maintain this very important infrastructure? What's the problem if, uh, if we say, okay, U.S. government is the right, right structure? Who might protest? I protest. Because yeah. <laughs> I want to shut down sites for no legal reason. Yeah, it, it'll make it incredibly easy to do that. Guys, we're probably tuning into some discussions about SOPA, for example, right? So there are a host of political reasons why this might be infeasible as well, in addition to the technical reasons. What's the solution? We have to distribute it, distribute it in some way, uh, technically as well as politically. So distribution is one of the requirements, but how about uh, some other requirements that we need in such a naming system? We want this naming system to be scalable. It has to be able to scale to the size of the internet. There are lots of hosts in the internet, and they all want descriptive names. Not all, but a lot of them. And the system has to scale to that uh, number. It has to have distributed control. We already talked about that. And it has to be fault tolerant because we, are, we already discussed one particular scenario when this naming system has gone down, but the rest of the internet is intact, but we still can't access the services we would like to access. So we, we want this system to be fault tolerant. The good news is this is an easier problem than a generic distributed database problem. Because it turns out this database is updated rarely. So we don't need to be able to update it you know, many, many times per second. <coughs> because how often do you put a new machine in the internet and say, OK, I want a name for it? Not very often. There are newer ways to use this naming service to do load balancing, et cetera, that tend to update this database, you know, not you know, once a day, but maybe you know, every few seconds. But we're still not talking about you know, sub-second updates. The updates are relatively infrequent. And it's mostly a read-only database, right? 
because most of us are interested in finding out what's the IP address of this particular site. We're not, we're not trying to update that mapping. So it's a mostly read-only database. And it's OK for the consistency to be loose in the sense that if someone decides, OK, this domain name is going to now map to this IP address, it's OK if that change doesn't propagate to the rest of the internet instantly. It's OK. What might happen is uh, we go to www.google.com, and we're still hitting the old server uh, for a few seconds or a few minutes. Uh, but that's fine. Uh, we don't need the changes to be reflected across the internet within a few milliseconds. Does that make sense? There are some consequences to loose consistency, by the way. Let's say you want to register a machine. Let's say you want to do a startup, and you want to have a website register a machine. The what, what's the consequence of loose consistency in that case? You can't access it until it's all fixed. Yeah. Some parts of the internet might be able to access that name right away. Some other parts might not be able to. So when you introduce this host into the internet, you have to actually take that into account. right? For example, let's say I have a very critical piece of information, and uh, you know, I want to put that on my own server and disseminate it across the internet. Should I tell people, OK, you know, I just registered the site and go to the site? They might not be able to. Does that make sense? Traditionally, people used to say, I think, 24 hours or something like that. These days, it seems like it can be done in a few hours. But there's still that lag, and you have to take that into account when you deploy services in the internet. Another nice thing is you can cache aggressively. And why is that? that? That's a consequence of one of the properties of this particular naming system. Why is it OK to cache aggressively? We also touched on this issue when we were talking about HTTP proxy. It doesn't change very often. Yeah, it doesn't change very often, so it's OK to cache aggressively. And sometimes you're going to make a mistake, but we've designed the whole internet to cope with that. Because we never assume that there will be tight consistency in the first place. So even if you um, make a mistake once in a while, a mistake here is serving stale entry. It's not the end of the world. The client might uh, go to the old website for a little bit, but it'll, it'll get updated eventually. <coughs> These names are organized in a hierarchy. It looks something like that, and we're all familiar with it. There are some top-level domains, for example, .edu, uh, this particular example. Then there is Princeton, so that's a, that's a machine within edu, potentially. But at least we can see the hierarchy in name. And there might be CS department. And there might be individual machines within that. You have all used this kind of name, right? So when you say www.facebook.com, so that com is a top level directory, right? And Facebook, what, what is Facebook in that case? Subzone. Okay, and then what is www? It might be a machine that is within Facebook. So it's it's yet another <laughs> name at a lower level of hierarchy. Does that does that make sense? So it's a hierarchy of names, and it doesn't have to be just three. It could be you know five levels if you wanted to. We use this kind of concept in daily life all the time. If you tell someone <coughs> where you live, and let's say you know, your friend lives really far away, you don't necessarily say, OK, here's the apartment number, right? You just say, you know, I live in Houston. And if the other party is interested in resolving that further, then you might say, OK, I live in this neighborhood, this street, uh, this you know, street number or apartment, depending on what you're interested in. So we use this kind of hierarchy all the time. Which Another uh, zone, um, where does the internet come in, the DNS server of Google, the 8888, you know, one? Mm -hmm. Because it, we they, can, have we, a, they have a copy of, uh, they have an address for every website, pretty much. 
yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to get to that hopefully, just yeah, to some extent. Like the thing that the sides of the, the center of the red thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll get to that hopefully today. If, if not, uh, we're going to continue our discussion of DNS next time. So, uh, <coughs> so it turns out for each level of hierarchy, there is a hierarchy of DNS servers as well. For example, there is a set of servers that are responsible for the top level domains. And what that means is they keep track of you know, what servers have information uh, related to names that belong in that hierarchy. And uh, for example, there, there might be a DNS server that's responsible for everything that's Princeton.edu. Again, we use this kind of concept in daily life you know, all the time, right? Because there is some kind of delegation going on in deciding who is responsible for resolving what part of the name, right? For example, who should be responsible for maintaining the mapping between PeopleSoft ID and your names? So should it be the you know, Houston city government? Probably not. This should be done at the right level, right? At the right level of hierarchy. So let's say there is a machine uh, in our department, and let's say it has a name. Who should be responsible for maintaining that mapping? Probably some server within our department, not uh, a server that's uh, being maintained by the US government, for example. Probably not, right? So what that means is, depending on what you're trying to resolve, you need to contact the appropriate DNS server. Does that make sense? For example, if I want to find out you know, what a PeopleSoft ID is, I need to go to this department here, not go to the US president's office. They might not have that information. So here is how the address resolution works. As we said in the previous slide, depending on exactly what you're trying to resolve, you have to contact the server that's responsible for that level of hierarchy. So let's say we have a client. Let me just try to point that. So let's say we have a client that is trying to resolve you know, what the IP address is corresponding to that particular name. So first, you send a request to the local DNS server, because typically we don't run DNS server on our laptops, right? Whenever we get uh, a DHCP configuration, the configuration also includes an address for what your DNS server is. Uh, at home, your ISP might say, you need to set your DNS to this IP address. Has that happened to you sometimes? When things don't work, they might say that. Or it might be done automatically for you. Basically, your computer knows, or your laptop, or your phone knows, you know, what your DNS server is, okay? So the IP address. So you send that request to the local DNS server. So we want to resolve that uh, address, right? So the first thing that we need to do is go to the root server. Because we start the resolution at the highest level. And then the root server says, okay, here are the IP addresses of all the top level, uh, all the DNS servers that are responsible for the top level domains. And what are the top level domains? COM, EDU, ORZ, et cetera, right? So this server is going to tell your DNS server if you want to find out anything about EDU, you need to contact this particular server. Then you contact that server, right? You're interested in poly.edu, right? Now, once you contact the server that's responsible for all the EDU names, that server is going to say, if you're interested in anything that's poly.edu, you better contact this other server that's responsible for maintaining all the names within poly.edu. So upon receiving that uh, response, this server knows that okay, it actually needs to contact you know, this other server, and so on and so forth. So do, do you see how the resolution works at different levels? And sometimes it's called, you might have heard of the word um, or phrase recursive lookup. So basically, one level is going to call another, and then another. This is a little bit different. This is more iterative. Do you see that? Any question on how 
addresses are resolved. Basically, start at the very top because you know we have no idea which server is responsible even for EDU. In that case, you go to the top level. And then the top level, the root server will say, OK, here's the server that's responsible for EDU. You go to that. Now, when you go to that server, you say, OK, now I'm interested in addresses, you know, poly.edu. What's the server for that? All right? Does your machine itself cache at least things? Results for yeah. Some of them. So that's the, that's the other part. So now it seems like this is going to take a lot of time. Let's say you know you're interested in going to www.facebook.com. It's going to take a lot of time, right? Many many round trips between your know, local DNS and all these uh, servers. So you actually have to cache everywhere aggressively. And if you cache, let's say someone has already done this resolution in the past, then this your local DNS server could have immediately replied saying, "Oh, here's the IP address." for the host you're looking for. Does that make sense? Any questions? OK. So where are the DNS root servers? Remember, root servers maintain the name and the addresses of the servers that actually are responsible for top-level domains. Top-level domains are CUM, EDU, ORZ, many country codes, etc. So it's actually even level beyond that, right? Because we kind of think that ORZ is the you know the root, right? But there's actually something you know above that that includes all the top level domains. So there there is an organization called Verisign. It's responsible for let's say the DNS root server, just in one place. So, but it turns out there are actually multiple root servers. And here, here is a quick assignment for you. I'm not going to grade, grade you on this. But I want you to go to that uh, website. And it will show you the list of uh, all the top level servers, or not top level, root servers, on a, on a map. I think it's uh, on Google Map, overlaid on Google Map. It's, it's nice to see that. So go to, go to that URL uh, when you go home. And uh, it will put a bunch of dots everywhere showing you where the root servers are. So what's the purpose of root servers? And they're replicated and so forth. What's the purpose of root servers? Because we want to know what, what, what is the server that's responsible for these top level names. We want to know, you know what server is responsible for you know, ORZ, right? Because we have to somehow bootstrap this mechanism. Don't we? Because how does, how does the web browser know where to start? Because bootstrapping is the interesting thing here. And it turns out you know, that's the most challenging. You can't completely distribute that. It turns out you need a central organization responsible for this. So I will uh, let you read some of these slides. but. Um, But I, I will tell you, you know, what that central organization is and how these uh, names are bootstrapped. <coughs> there is a related concept called reverse mapping. Sometimes you need to know the name given the address. So we've talked about how to convert a name to an address. But sometimes you need to go in the other direction. Why might you want to do that? <coughs> So who's experienced uh, running some web servers? Yeah, you have somebody come into the server and you know where they came from. Yeah, you, you want to know where someone you know, lo loaded a page from your web server. If you just have IP address, it's hard for me to understand okay, where that IP address uh, is from, which country, which city sometimes. Is it an EDU or in a government? organization, so on and so forth. Sometimes we might want to convert an IP address to, to a name. So that process is called reverse mapping. And there's a specific technique for doing that. Rather than spoon feeding you, I want you to go to that link and study that. And 
and understand it. But, uh, but at least uh, you guys understand why it might be important sometimes. And there's a specific way of doing that. Uh, related to uh, what we said earlier about hierarchical names, let's think about this reverse mapping. So basically, what reverse? we need a table that converts an IP address to a name. Right? That's what reverse mapping is. Who should maintain this table? So earlier we were talking about a table that converts name to an IP address. But now, if you want to convert an IP address to a name, who should maintain this table? It's, it's probably the same type of hierarchy. Because we don't want uh, our ISP to have to maintain these names for us. Because we want flexibility on you know, which hosts we want to put in, which hosts we want to take out, sometimes we want to rename the hosts, and so forth. So caching is very important because we don't want to send the same request for resolution to the servers again and again for two reasons, two broad reasons. One, from server's perspective, that would be just a lot of load, a lot of requests coming in, redundant requests. And from client's perspective, that would reduce the latency. If a, if a client can receive a response quickly without having to do the whole recursive lookup, it will reduce the latency. So those are the two main benefits from caching in the context of DNS. Sometimes you might also want negative caching. If there are some requests that are incorrect, and if they're done frequently, it makes sense to have incorrect or negative caching as well. A common typo might be you know, www.facebook.com, you know, for example, right? And if a lot of people make that mistake, then it's wasteful to do the resolution for this because you're not going to cast this request because it never results in success. So every time someone makes that typo, you're going to send that request and do the whole recursive lookup. And because you know, this, uh, this lookup is never successful, you're never going to cache that. So it might be important to do negative caching sometimes. DNS protocol runs on a standard port, port 53. What, what, protocol, uh, what port does HTTP run on? Port 80, usually. right? Most of the time, you use UDP, not TCP. <coughs> you guys are using TCP to send and receive HTTP messages. If you want to write a program that talks DNS, typically do that on UDP. So when you send a request to the DNS server, you get a response. And that response usually has a certain format. What's the main information that we are looking for in the response? We're looking for, OK, you asked what the corresponding IP address is for this particular name, and here's the IP address. Right? That's the main information that we're looking for. Those are called address records. For example, here, this is, I just copied you know, from one of the DNS replies, it says bio.csws.edu. Um, address is the IP address that's uh, given there. 3600, that's the time to live. That is the duration for which that response is valid. And if the same server receives another request for bio.csws.edu, it's not going to send a request out to the DNS servers. Because for 3600 seconds, this mapping is valid. That's one hour, right? Another type of record is called NS. What the second line suggests is if you're interested in finding out the mapping for any host within cs.uh.edu, the name server is ns2.us.edu. That's the server you go to and ask. So if I want to find out what's the IP address for bio.cs.us.edu, that's the server I need to go to.
And here's a, here's a little bit of a puzzle. Because this comes back to how to bootstrap all of this. So I know which server to go to if I am interested in finding out what the IP address for bio.cs.us is. What's the name of the server? ns2.us.edu, right? Now the question is, how do I connect to that server? I need an IP address. So what's the IP address of ns2.us.edu? It seems like a problem here. No, because... Right. So the only way you can send a packet to a particular computer is by using IP address, because that is what the routers understand. So when you say ping dot, uh, let's say, ns2.us.edu, what's happening is this translation is happening underneath, so that you have the IP address and you send a ping packet to that host. So you, you need an IP address. So there's something called blue record that is included in the response that tells you, okay, IP address of ns2.us.edu is this. So that's called blue record. If that helps in bootstrapping. Otherwise, we would, we would not be able to send a packet to ns2.us.edu just using the name. So that's the blue record there. There is a command called dig that you can use to explore how address resolution might work. For example, let's say I'm interested in finding out what the IP address for this particular name is. I started the root servers. The response of this command will tell me I need to go to that particular server given here if I'm interested in any name with .edu at the end. And I ask that server, OK, I'm interested in finding out finding more about this name. I send my request to that particular server. And this server will tell me that, OK, if you're interested in anything US or EDU, you need to talk to that particular server over there. Send that request to that server. And I, I'm interested in finding the IP address for this name. And that server actually tells me that you actually need to go to dns.cs.us.edu. You can run these commands yourself, actually. I want you to do that before next class. It'll just take a few minutes. All right, I think we should stop there. And you know, here's a, you know, what, what, a, what, is, what a trace might look like, a dig trace might look like. So in the next class, we're going to continue our discussion about DNS. <coughs> Uh, there are a few more slides from this lecture that we'll do, and then uh, more advanced features of DNS. All right? Thank you. <laughs>